Are you forever stuck in first draft, much less not even touched your book at all? Well, today's guest is going to get you going in no time, so stay tuned. Welcome to Self-Publishing with Dale. And if you want tips and strategies for self-publishing your own books, then make sure you subscribe and turn on your notifications to get all my latest videos. Today's guest is Martin McConnell, and he's gonna show you just how you can go from idea to paper to publish. Martin's a full-time author, content creator, and self-professed wannabe farmer who has published over half a dozen books and written scores of others just waiting to be published. Martin holds a physics degree, and when he isn't writing speculative fiction, he's motivating other authors, stargazing, reading, and playing Kerbal Space Program. He avidly encourages everyone he meets to seize control of their dreams by driving their own plot. And that's what brings him to the show today. He has a unique backstory and an exceptional mindset on the process of writing and publishing. Welcoming to the show, Martin. How you doing, man? Doing great, man. How are you? Live and kicking, live and kicking. You and I are kind of just chopping it up a little bit and it's always kind of funny whenever I start to kind of go this. You're the first person who hasn't flinched as soon as I go into the high energy because you notice it goes from right here up to here all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, man, you, you know, um, I've given a little bit of a background. I think the most fascinating thing about you is what you did before getting into writing, before becoming an author. Tell a little bit about your background when it came to being on, am I correct in saying you were actually on the water in an oil rig when you first wow. wrote your book? On a lot of them, actually. I, uh, uh, I worked for one of the biggest uh, oil field services companies in the whole world. So I did a lot of traveling. But when I started writing that first book, it was we were sitting on an oil rig out in the Gulf of Mexico and drilling had slowed down. We kept getting stuck and having hole problems. So I was left kind of sitting there and I had a story in mind that I wanted and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it because at the time I was doing little pixel comics and I was contemplating the idea of having a graphic novel ready for it and took all my paper out there and stuff started getting folded up because those offshore bags are, they're kind of scrunchy. You get them on a helicopter and everything inside gets destroyed if it's not protected. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, uh, I did a bunch of high tech stuff, mostly computer things. So we get out there, rig up, um, run cables from one side of the drill ship to the other. And at the time, I think we were in about 5,000 feet of water when I started writing that first book. Wow. That's tremendous. It just shows that you can pretty much do it just from about anywhere. It's just a, not even a case of lack of resources. It's a, it's a lack of imagination and resilience. Right. And resilience being the sticking point. I mean, uh, when it comes to imagination, almost everybody's got a story. As soon as I tell someone I'm a writer, they're like, oh, you should write a book about this or you should write a book about that. I'm like, no, you should sit your ass down and write that book because that's, <laughs> that's your idea. You know, it's not mine. Uh, I've got plenty of ideas in my head. I can't shut them up most of the time. So <laughs> that's the biggest problems with creative minds like you and I, that we have far too many ideas as the day is long. And it's just, you know, and, and I, I can relate to this. And anybody that's watching this interview, if you can relate to this, say something in the comments about this. How many times have you had a family member or a friend come up to you and go, well, you should write this no, I shouldn't write this. You should do this. So this leads us over to my first question. And it's about probably one of my most favorite books I've read lately and finish the damn book. You, uh, in your book, finish the damn book. You share a little bit of how you wrote your first novel in 47 days on a floating oil rig, as we've discussed. What was the secret to getting it done? And what was your motivation? Because man, you're on an oil rig out in the middle of nowhere. What kept you going? Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, drilling had slowed down, and I had a story that I wanted to get out, and actually the key motivating factor, I think, was they put us up in staterooms on the ship, so this drill ship's like the size of a football field, literally, oh, Wow! and we, I'd go in, and somebody had left a copy of a book in my, uh, in my bunk rack that I took over when I got out there. Yeah, And so I went to bed one night with the idea for the graphic novel that I wanted to write about my little biking story in my head. And I flipped this book open and I started reading through it. And this is a, a published book. I mean, it was 
written, published by a major publisher, put out everywhere and ended up in my bunk rack. And I thought, this is horrible. You know, if this guy can, if this dude can do it with what he's doing right now, then I could totally do this because I know I can write better than this motherfucker. <laughs> so, um, that was kind of the initial start off that got me into it. And so I went out to our shack. We called it the, the trailer park on the rigs. It's basically a bunch of Connex boxes at the back where I had all my computers set up. And I sat down and I was looking over my sketches and my story notes. And I'm like, I've got pages and pages of story. I have enough here for a hundred graphic novels. You know, why don't I just write this as a book? So I sat down and started writing. And I think the biggest motivational thing that I had was I didn't have anybody there to tell me if I was doing it the right way or the wrong way. So like I point out in the book, I pulled up a Google search and I started looking, okay, what do I need to do to write a novel? How many how many pages does it need to be? Because I was still thinking in pages at the time. How long should it take me to write it? This and that. I came across a website that basically said you should be able to write a first draft of your novel in 100 days or less. So I was like, okay, cool. That's my timeline. That's, that's where I'm staying. And I never questioned it because I didn't have any formal background. So yeah. I basically didn't know what I was doing. And they had these wonderful little writing prompts. So every day you could log in and you could look at one of the prompts and it had a cookie that would save your progress. So if you skipped ahead three prompts, you'd come back the next day and it'd have the, the fourth one up and ready for you to read. And then I just sat down and went to it. So. That's tremendous. So it just, it was just chipping away at something just slowly, but surely that got you to the finished product then. Right. I mean, I had uh, storyboards locked down, so I had kind of an outline to go off of, but even with my, my nano, book that I'm working on right now, um, you go off the rails pretty quick and you just dip off the outline and <laughs> your characters become their own living things and they're going to do what they want to do. So I just follow it along. And uh, one of the, the guy that I was working with, the directional driller, who would come in, we'd have coffee in the morning and we'd get out to our little box and he'd walk in with his copy, say, so how's your main character doing today? What are they up to? What kind of trouble are they getting into? So I kind of had him there. Um, talking to me and if I had 10 or 20 minutes to write where I wasn't doing something else running around fixing a sensor or doing something else on the rig then I'd just hammer it out for that 10 or 20 minutes till I got interrupted push it to the side do my work thing and then when I got another 10 minute break I'd go right back at it how was the process after you did your first draft? Uh, did you immediately go into editing? Did you get a hold of a professional editor? How, how was that? Uh, get me from first draft to final draft. From first draft to final draft, um, I went straight to editing. I mean, I had actually gotten off the rig a couple days before I finished. So as soon as I got home, I finished it up. And I printed everything out and I went back to page one and looked at it and I said, Oh my God, this is horrible. <laughs> somehow in that 80,000 words from start to finish, my writing had already changed so much that I went from complete newbie to following this advice and reading blog posts. And you could literally see the difference from page one to page 300. I mean, it was wow. black and white. Is that, uh, is that the same uh, way it is now? Do you find that you're more polished at the beginning or at the end as you are to the beginning of the book? Is it that much change or progress? Um, I don't think I've stopped progressing, so I still notice the change, but it's not quite that dramatic. I, I tell everybody the first 100,000 words you write, there's going to be a big change between where you started and where you ended up. And that's just something that's going to happen, so be ready for it when you go back to edit your first book. You are going to think everything on the front page is garbage and you're going to start suspecting your wife and her sister and everybody else around you of fiddling with your documents when you weren't looking. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to uh, use that excuse on my first book. I know that mine was just a complete, it just, it was abysmal. Uh, why do you think writers are forever stuck in the planning phase and not writing it? Um, it's an interesting question, but usually when I get asked, it gets put to me a different way mm -hmm. because it's writers that come to me and they'll already be sort of starting their book. But I think in a way they're still in the planning phase, but it's the same problem on both sides is people are after a pursuit of perfection. You know, 
when you go out to build a house nowadays, you get the blueprints and you lay everything out from the wall color to what kind of tile you're going to use on the floor before anybody ever gets commissioned to start building the house. And I think when people start writing, they're stuck in that mindset. So they want to have everything nailed down and perfect before they even put their fingers on the keys. And then even when they start writing, that persists. That's that same problem of going back, editing page one over and over and over again. And just that back and forth um, kind of drives them crazy a little bit because you get stuck in the mindset of this needs to be perfect, where if you just let it go and brain dump and get the story out of your head and on paper, then you can start weaving those little threads together and you've got a whole unit to finish. So there's people that are stuck at the beginning and then there's people that are done and there's not many in between because people just they keep recycling that same thing over and over. They want to be perfect on the first draft. You know, they want to mm -hmm. their first swing of the hammer at a rock to all of a sudden all the little pieces are going to crumble off just right. And then you're going to have your sculpture. But um, in any artistic endeavor, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, you've got to rough out the area that you want and the distribution for the work. And then you go in and start chipping away at the fine details. I noticed one thing that you had shared within your book, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, your, your belief is consistency, is doing it, the writing practice daily, if possible, so that way you're not having to go back and rehash some of those things and get trapped in the editing cycle. Right, yeah, that's another reason that uh, people will start in progress. If you go back to edit and then you waste yourself that day editing and you don't add anything new to the book, then that's another day that you haven't been thinking ahead, you're thinking back. And it's even worse if you skip a day of writing or you're like, okay, well, I'm tired, I don't wanna do it today, and then it becomes two days and three days and a week and a month, and before you know it, you've forgotten what the story was, so you have to go back. And when you go back a second time, now you're attacking maybe 20,000 words you've already written and you can't remember what they say, so you have to go back and read them and that takes you a couple days. <laughs> then, you know, it burns you out on actually creating. It just kills the creative process. I felt almost like you were spying on me previously because that's the exact process that I'll go through is I will binge write something and then I go, I kind of get mentally burnt out. That willpower tank kind of drains and I go, oh, I'll come to it in another few days and then I come back and then here I am, I'm stuck going through going, what did I write and how did it go? And then I get stuck in that editing process once again. So that is, I think you're spying on me, man. I think you're on to me here. <laughs> Possible. Uh, being primarily a fiction writer, do you think your advice holds up for nonfiction writers too, so people like me then? Um, when it comes to nonfiction, I think the most important aspect of the book is, because nonfiction is not, as creative as a, of a process. It's more like dumping information down on a page. Yeah. So you've already got the information, you've got the outline ready to go, and but the iterative process I think is still there. So in other words, you're gonna start with your outline, you're gonna lay everything out, and in some ways it's easier because with nonfiction, you already know what you wanna say. And all you have to do is block it up into chapters, and then when you're ready to go, you can go at it. You don't have to worry about forgetting you know, where uh, your main character left his coat in the last scene when you start up the next one. I mean, you can go straight through, but you still have to go through the draft from start to finish. Cause as you said, if you get distracted, then one day becomes a week before you know it. Um, so as far as the iterative process is concerned, it's still identical. I mean, you're still going to start the book. You're going to write out the first couple of chapters. And when you get done and you go back to edit it the first time, you're going to notice problems with your writing and the more times you go through and iterate um, you might come up with other chapter ideas or you might take some chapters out when I wrote uh, finished the damn book like it was one chapter literally that I sent off to some friends and they're like where's chapter two so <laughs> I went back and I said okay I'm gonna hash this out into chapters and I wrote six chapters of the book <laughs> and then I went back again and I'm like well this isn't really going to work for a book and I could, I need to inject this somewhere. So I was still moving things around and iterating every time I went through it. So the book has gone through several progressions, not just what normal people think of as editing, you know, where you go in and you pretty up the little sentences. I mean, that's part of it, but you're also moving blocks yeah. of data around and that happens in the fiction and the nonfiction world. So 
the advice of just getting it down on paper and getting it out of your head still applies very much in the in the nonfiction world too. Yeah, that's one thing. I actually haven't checked out your fiction work yet. Obviously, I've checked out your blog. That's how you and I became familiar with each other through Twitter. And then I discovered your blog. And uh, I was like, man, love this stuff. And then I picked up, finished the damn book. And I read it this past weekend. And one thing I noticed about you is, first of all, A, you pull no punches in the book. And uh, B, you're very articulate. Uh, and it's not so much to where it's, it's speaking over anybody's heads. It's, it is very exact in how you say that. So did you find that you were able to write it that way? Or is it much like your fiction work where you had to kind of refine that product through numerous edits? Um, as far as the, the speech and nomenclature that I use in the book, mm -hmm. I wanted that to be as raw as possible. So I tried to go with my gut instinct on most of it, but I would still have blocks in there where I would just trail off on some random tangent for three or four pages. So there, there were instances where I had to go back to edit, not necessarily for voice, because I wanted the voice to sound raw and grit and like I was talking to the person who's reading the book. And you can't, you can't create that as well if you are trying to do it, if you're making it a process where, okay, which words are going to stick with the person the best? Well, they're the words that drop out of your mouth when you're talking to them. That's what they're going to pick up on. That but, makes sense. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And it definitely it resonated really well with me because I found that I just, and it's not too long of a book that I was able to sit down and actually read it in about one to two sittings. So that, that was one of the perfect things about it. So um, I'm going to kind of transition just a little bit here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the newbies, the people that primarily are probably watching this video. Uh, and this might even apply to some of the experienced people, but let's talk to the newbies here. There's two types of writers, and I think you're familiar with them. There's the pantser, this person that just writes by the seat of their pants. They have a rough idea of what they're going to do, and they just go. And then there's the plotter. There's the person that just goes point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and they've got everything planned out. So which do you think is best for the newbie writer? Well, I get asked about the pantsing versus plotting argument a lot, obviously running the blog and getting other authors that when they pick up on Twitter and they see me spouting all this stuff, they will occasionally drop me a line. And my consensus on the matter is there really isn't two categories. There's not pantsing and plotting, but it's just a range, like a rainbow from start to finish. So like a spectrum. Right. Like if you read Douglas Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. the first page of that book, you can just shake your head at it and say, okay, he had absolutely no idea where he was going. And he just dropped this normal character into this world. And it, when you read it, it sounds like he was just pulling ideas out of the air. It's like, okay, you know, it'd be fun. I'll knock his house down and then I'll knock his planet over. So um, it sounds like he didn't really put any any emphasis into plotting the book. Yeah, but I think most of us, at least at the very minimum, have an idea uh, that we want to answer with the book. You know, what would happen if the world was created like this? So that, in a way, is an outline of its own. It's a target that you're reaching for. Mm -hmm. And a pantser would be a person who would say, write that on a piece of paper, stick it to their computer, and then just write the book with just that one that one image in mind and see what happens whereas i think very few of us will finish if we just take a character and drop them into a story and hit the go button but it can work and it's very liberating and it's easy to keep your fingers on the keys because you're sort of just following along and you're picturing in your head what this character is doing and you're just writing it down mm -hmm. whereas plotting um it's easy to go overboard because if you make an outline like you did when you were in high school and you've got every little detail hammered out from start to finish and your characters decide they want to deviate and go over here instead on, you know, number three, then all of a sudden the entire rest of the outline sometimes can get scrapped. So for newbie authors, I'll basically give them the advice to number one, if you haven't read Stephen Pressfield, um, he's got a great book can't recall the name of it off the top of my head right now, but he basically says, grab a piece of paper, write down the beginning, the middle, the end, and fill in the details. And that's kind of what I did naturally for my first book, and I still sort of stick to that. And sometimes I will, if there's details that I'll have to work out, like if there's a spaceship in the book, 
and I need to work out how far it can travel or what the limitations of it are, then I'll do my research for those sections so I don't end up looking at them later. And when I wrote that first book, I had all this historical research, just pages and pages of it laid out in front of me because I was like, at some point in the story, I'm going to have to deal with this and I would rather deal with it now than when I'm in the middle of the writing process. So I think the best advice for a writer starting off as far as pantsing versus plotting is to write down as much of the story as you know. If that's only one sentence, get it out of your head, write it down on a piece of paper. If it's a theme that you want to follow, write it down on a sticky note and stick it to your laptop or your typewriter so that you can see it every time you're writing. If you kind of have an idea, okay, I want these seven things to happen and this is going to be the climax and then I'm going to wrap it up sort of like this, you can write those down just one sentence at a time and then while you're writing, just focus on getting to the next point on the list. So there, and every degree in between, right? It matters. It depends on the person. And the real answer is after you write about two or three books, you're going to figure out what you need to have and what you don't. So when you're starting off the first time, um, pretty much pants your plotting process, so to speak. Just try something and run with it. And if it's not working for you, you can always go back and reevaluate whatever you have wrote down during the writing process. Because if your outline is one page, then you can change that out. Like before you begin a writing session, you can be like, okay, well, this isn't working. Yeah. I'm go ahead and do these things to sort of steer my characters back to the story. And then you can just continue on the way that you're going. And I always find that towards the end of a novel, when you're getting close to the climax and you really want to stick that last point, it gets difficult to follow an outline. So if things aren't going the way the outline is, just keep writing the story and you're going to get to your climax eventually. So write down everything, keep on going, because uh, at some point your characters are going to take your outline and toss it out the window. So be ready for that if you outline a lot. And if they don't, great. But if they do, just follow them around, see what they do and figure out how they're going to solve the problem. Because at that point they've taken the reins, so you don't need to worry about it anymore. That's tremendous. I appreciate that advice. And it definitely helps me out a little bit too, as I'm kind of dipping my toes into the fiction realm. Uh, question, who do you study to become such a polished writer? Because I enjoyed reading your prose. So I would love to know, how can I practice and get better? Who are some of the people I should look after? Um, I think the key there is we all have our own writing style. Mm -hmm. So the people that you like to read, even if they're not popular, um, those are the people that you should be reading for inspiration. Because at the end of the day, your work and work in general is very subjective. So 12 publishers might tell J.K. Rowling to go piss off and then another one picks her up and she becomes a superstar. But subjectively, when you're reading somebody else's work, it's either going to resonate with you or it's not. And mm -hmm you're not going to write something that's going to resonate with everybody. And none of these authors have written things that resonate with everybody. I mean, there are people that love Stephen King and people that absolutely hate him. Yeah. So if you're trying to figure out what things are going to work in your book, you have to read books that you enjoy reading, which is nice to know, right? Because if you already enjoy reading it, it's not a lot of work to, to read some more. Um, another thing I recommend is reading books that you hate from time to time. Figure out what's not working for this author and be like, okay, i would noticed that I've been doing this in my book, so I need to stop doing that because this isn't working at all for me. Um, so it's a very subjective thing. I can't recommend any authors directly because everybody's got a different style. I personally love Douglas Adams. I think he's funny as hell, but there are other people who read his work and they're like, this is dry British humor and it's boring and you know, whatever, and they towed it off. And like I said, there are people that love Stephen King, people that hate Stephen King. So if you love him, look through his words and see what's working for him. If you absolutely hate him, read his one of his novels and just pick it apart from start to finish. And everything that you mark out with a red pen, make the decision that you can learn from, from right and wrong. Like I said, when I was on the drill ship, I picked up a book and I absolutely hated it. And I was like, okay, if this hack can convince a bunch of people that his work deserves to be published, then I could probably do it too. 
you know, it can be a motivating thing. I'm not saying you should read things you hate all the time, but you can yeah. see patterns, which is why I try to, I mean, I diversify. I go on Kindle and I look for whatever's free when I feel like reading and I just download all the book covers that interest me. And I might only read a page of it. I might only read a paragraph, but I know right away when I start reading whether or not I can follow along with this writer's writing. And if it's something that resonates with me or something really, really sticks, I try to look into the, into the pros and figure out what they did. Like, how did you do this? How did you evoke this feeling? How did you come up with this sentence? And how can I emulate sentences like that? So if I'm feeling like I need some, some inspiration to sort of spruce up my descriptions, then I will read Patrick O'Brien because his books are long and they're all about sailing ships in the 1800s, which is something that I like reading about anyways. Yeah. But he has a way of just describing things very, very colorfully. And so even if I'm not taking his results directly, I can read two chapters out of his book. And then I go and I start writing something that's science fiction that's completely unrelated, but I can feel nicer words start flowing out of my fingertips. Um, Interesting. So in order to, to really perfect your craft of writing, you got to be a voracious reader then. Um, I think you can get away with reading. Like if, if you're not a, if you're not a bookworm and you don't digest, you know, fiction novels every other day, that's okay. You can still pick up on the stuff that you liked, you know, and most of us have read enough books that we kind of have a grasp on what we like and what we don't. Yeah. So you can go back and look at some of those old books and just read through the ones that you really loved again. That way it's not a chore, but um, it does, it definitely does help to read as much as you can when you get time, as long as it doesn't interfere with your drafting. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's the thing uh, you know, sometimes getting distracted uh, can be dangerous to your writing career. So uh, I've got a question. We're going to start to wrap things up here. If you had to choose, what would you take? Would you take passion or would you take profit? Um, I think I already made that choice, actually. I, uh, I was working that oil field job and clearing six figures every year. And one day, about halfway through the viral series, which is um, that's been taken out of print, and I'm re releasing Viral Spark. So that's like the novel version of the same story. Um, I just decided, you know what? I can't do this anymore. This is too much stress. I'm yelling at everybody. Uh, making a six-figure income and being able to go out and buy whatever I want when I feel like it without having to worry about where the money's going to come from yeah. is nice. But this is what I really want to do. I want to write things. I want to inspire people. I want to help other people with their writing. I want to hang out with artists and creators and crafters and I want to leave my own imprint on the world. So that's what I'm going to do. So I dropped the, the high paying stressful job and now I have all new stresses being a poor writer. <laughs> yeah, the, the starving artist syndrome. So, uh, but I mean, I imagine with how good you are and especially it seems like you're getting yourself out there. There's got to be some kind of upward growth. There's going to probably be some kind of a reward at some point. So where do you see your writing career in the next five to 10 years? Um, I'm probably going to be taking more freelance jobs for, for the money part of it while I'm working on getting the passion part to work out for me. Yeah. But I mean, what I'd really like is to get a couple books published by major publishers, you know, go the trade publishing route and then continue to put out works my own. So I'm sort of, sort of a hybrid thinker. If I can, my main concentration for next year, for instance, is building my backlist and I want to keep building my backlist. Nice. So I want to take all these stories that I've been writing and packing away that got rejected by a couple of agents and publishers mm -hmm. and just polish them up a little bit put them out there, get a professional cover design on them and just build that backlist so that people who enjoy my writing and my style will have something to read. You know, I can just keep putting books out there for them. And if I only end up with a hundred uh, fans that like reading my writing, then that's cool. You know, I'll just keep writing books for them and working on the other stuff on the side. But my real goal I think is to make enough income off of the stuff that I like to write 
to where I could just keep doing that indefinitely and I can work on my farm stuff and, you know, just live in the country, do my own thing and my own things, writing books and playing in the dirt, I guess. <laughs> That's not a bad life uh, by any stretch. Uh, how can viewers find you, Martin? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Spotted Gecko. It's spelled a little funny. Um, but on rightfarmlive.com, which is my website, there's a little block on the left side of the screen that's got all my contact information in it. So you can find me on Twitter, Goodreads. I have a Amazon author page, a Facebook page. I'm just literally everywhere. Or uh, one thing I criticized my mother on when she was overseas with family and she's like, we were looking for a picture of you and we couldn't find it. I'm like, did anybody think to just Google my name? <laughs> You're Googleable. Yes. I the first four pages of Google for my name. Just type it in. <laughs> Tremendous. Very good, Martin. Well, I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to sit down and give me a little bit of 411. And uh, hopefully uh, anybody that's watching this um, and you've got some kind of inspiration from this, you know, let me know your thoughts on some of what Martin shared inside this interview today. I really want you the viewers to go out there and just start writing. There's so many of you that are just stuck in your first draft. And I believe that Martin McConnell is giving you the goods, giving you the reason, giving you the motivation to get it going. I can't recommend enough. Pick up, finish the damn book today. I mean, on an ebook, it is rather cost effective and it's going to get you that motivation and some of the inspiration and info to get going. Well, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure that you share it with another person who's into publishing books too. Till later, this has been Self-Publishing with Dale, and I'll see you soon.